Good evening, guys, and welcome to our inaugural event for Resource at Home. Um, we have Johnny Cantaneo here, and he is going to be making sense of your steam and hot water heating systems and boilers. Um, he is a master plumber, and he is also a, a teacher of the subject, so he's going to be leading us in discussion. Um, I'm also going to be taking questions. So if you have any, you can just simply raise your hand using the Zoom mechanism, or you can type it into the, um, into the chat box. I think you guys all know how to use this. So I am Carla LaBianca. I am one half the administrative team of SOMA at home and co-founder and co-producer of the trade show resource at home, resource home show. And the, uh, the other half of Danbro LaBianca, a realty within Caldwell Banker. So without further ado, my friends, let's kick this off to Johnny. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Carla. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to go over uh, some steam heating systems. I think most of us have steam heat. Some of you might have uh, some forced hot, uh, hot water systems, which is a a, a boiler that heats water and then, you know, lower than the point of making steam. And yet then you have a pump on that boiler that moves the water around through radiators and the, the heat in the radiators obviously heats, heats your room so that you may have that kind of system. And if you do, please let me know. We can, we can touch on some of that, but, but overwhelmingly, I think people are, are most afraid of their steam heating systems. The, and that's the, the ones we see in our part of the world mostly um it, it's it's uh when i say that i mean it's a it's an interesting um it's an interesting figure to know that the the uh the united states overwhelmingly heats their homes the homes that have heat are heated with forced warm air 85 percent of the country heats their homes with forced air uh the remaining 15 percent is uh is done with uh with steam or um, or forced hot water circulating hot water systems, uh, including ra radiant in floor and radiators and, and and that kind of thing. But but of that fifteen percent of the country, like ninety percent of that is in the northeastern United States. So that's really how how we do it here, uh, which is kind of unique, you know, to, to the rest of the country. Uh, Brian has hot water. With circulated pumps, okay, Brian. So we'll get we'll get into we'll get into that a bit. Um, I'm going to show you what a uh, steam heating system looks like, and to do that, I will share my screen. This one, okay. So this is basically the, the anatomy of, of a, what we call a one pipe steam heating system. Steam heating, uh, steam heating systems become in two basic varieties, one pipe and two pipe. So one pipe has um, one pipe connected to the radiator and the two pipe variety has two pipes connected to the radiator. It's usually one high and one low like this. And so, you know, we call those one and two pipe steam systems. Uh, the, the piping is critical in both systems, that the arrangement of piping is critical. And so we have, so it used to be that that's, uh, boilers were, steam boilers were partially filled with water and they had a big open space in the top that we call the steam chest and steam and water would separate there and steam would rise up, uh, sort, of, sort of pure steam would rise up out of, out of, the, out of the system and out. I'm sorry, out of the boiler, go up into the, into the piping and uh, rise into the radiators and make them hot and heat the rooms. Now boilers are, are a lot smaller and that separation that used to happen in this, in this steam chest, what we call the steam chest, now happens in the piping. And so the piping around the boiler has become critical. We have a, a, pipe, a pipe that comes out of the top of the boiler. There could be one or two or more and they comes out of the boiler and creates something called what we call the near boiler piping. Um, we have a, a boiler riser or a boiler takeoff. These, these are interchangeable terms, takeoff and riser, interchangeable terms. The pipe comes out of there, turns horizontal. We call this the header. 
this horizontal uh, 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 bit of piping here, we call a header. And that's where um, um, water that's, that's contained in, the, in that um, rising heating medium, the water uh, stays at the bottom of this header pipe while the steam separates and rises and goes up into this uh, supply main and, and, um, and the steam gets sent throughout the, uh, throughout the piping system and then into your radiators and all that. So, uh, and then that, that water that isn't sent up into the piping rolls safely back down this pipe, what we call the equalizer and back down into the boiler where it's recycled and it becomes more steam. So, uh, so what moves steam? What, what delivers steam from the, from the boiler to, to the, um, to the radiators, uh, to, to the endpoints, what we do is we add air vents. Air vents determine where steam uh, will end up. They, they determine an end point for the, for the moving steam. So we make pressure in the boiler, right? We make steam pressure there. And then we have these air vents or vent valves, lots of terminology for this, where, where air is being pushed out of, of the vent and steam will follow. Steam and air cannot occupy the same space. And so we need to get rid of air for steam, for steam to move. Steam is constantly being uh, created in the boiler. It rises up through the piping, through the, uh, through the main. Notice that this main is not straight. This pipe is pitched, right? Pitch is very important in, the, um, in, a, in a steam system because It's uh, all, uh, to the endpoint of the system where it is delivered. You know, it, it, the, the uh, condensate drops down uh, below this water line that you see in, in the vertical glass tube in your in your boiler. Uh, that vertical glass tube is showing you a water level, right? Mm -hmm. And that water level is consistent throughout the entire basement. So everything, everything, all the piping below that water line that you see there is full of water. So if the water level is being shown here, then we know that all of the piping in the system is also um, un underwater or, or carrying water instead of, instead of carrying steam. Uh, any questions so far? Um, Johnny, it looks like Zach has a question. Please. Um, how critical is wrapping insulation around your pipes in the basement section? Some of our pipes are wrapped down there, but most sections are not. So there are two schools of thought when it comes to insulation. One is if, if, that, if the heat from the pipes is being lost to within the building envelope, um, is it really lost? Um, it, you know, you're, you're, you're just sort of delivering it in a different way. You, you, you may be uh, heating your basement with, with unwrapped steam pipes. And that's kind of a legitimate way you know, to heat your basement and make it livable. So there's that. The other, the other um, way of looking at insulation on steam pipes is that if you want heat somewhere, you add a radiator you know, and you want to deliver your, your steam to your radiator. You don't, um, what you don't want to do is uh, have too much condensation forming in, in the delivery um, because that'll affect some of the radiators that down the line. So there's not, a, there's not one great answer, answer for that uh, question, except to say that if your unwrapped, uninsulated pipes are making your basement livable, um, don't, don't feel terrible about it. it it's, that, that still kind of works. Um, however, um, insulation is, is a good thing and um, you know, it, it, helps, it helps to deliver the energy to the endpoints, which really truly is the goal. Adding, adding heat to a basement is usually an expensive thing to do. So if, if you're getting it um, by default, by just having some, uh, on some, uh, some exposed piping, you know, I, I'm, I'm for that. I, I don't think that's a terrible thing. Okay. Thank you. Do we have time for another question before sure. you go? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so Karen Wallace asks, it looks like my glass tube is full to the top. Do I turn the top knob to release some water? Karen, is it always full to the top?
Karen, okay. Now yeah, you're muted, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, I really don't pay that. I don't really, I don't, I recall, I don't think it's supposed to be. Right. And the it's sign not. says, the sign says maximum recommended water level. And it's like two inches below the top of the glass tube. Okay, that, that's fine. The, that's so, fine. The, yeah, the glass tube, you just want to see it. You know, there's, there's a point where it's too low and the boiler won't run. You know, the low water cutoff will, will shut the boiler. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want the water to be so high that you don't see it in, in the glass. That's, that's bad because then you just don't know where the water is. It might be up in the piping. Oh, like, yeah, that's the way it is. Yeah. I don't see a line. Oh, you don't? No, no. got to bring that down then. You have to uh, open something. A, a drain on the bottom of the boiler or something. You have to open something and bring that down. You have to see the, the water level. Make sure that, okay. so that glass has two, two valves, one on top and right. one on the bottom. Yeah, mm -hmm. make sure they're both counterclockwise. Make sure they're both open. Johnny, how does she do that? I mean, what does she, is, is, should it be labeled that as such uh, that, she, that that's a, a way to remove some of the water? Um, let's take a look here. Let's yeah, just... Because we're we're novices at the okay this. okay just want to make yeah sure I know I start off a little it. kind of technical with this but um, let me see what I can find here sorry mm. okay do we see this picture yeah that's great that's great okay here we are good. So here's here's the sort of the business side of your boiler. Usually it's everything's on one side. The other side is not, not much going on there. Um, so uh, here, this is the gauge glass, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sight glass. Some people like to call it, and that's fine. Um, it's protected by two metal rods here, so you so it makes it right. harder to break. But people still find ways to break to break it. Um, but but this valve lets air in the top. This valve lets water in the bottom. Okay, and you just want to turn them. And make sure that they're um, okay. Counterclockwise. Make sure that they're open. Okay. okay. Um, let's 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 look at this now. If if there's um, if there's too much water, and you don't see the level in there, then you can open up this drain valve, and and get some get some water out. Um, it's going down now. Oh, oh yay! We're, we're doing this in <laughs> real awesome. time. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so should I make it be, stop? <laughs> wait, you should be able to see it. Wait until you can okay. see the level. It should okay. be, you know, a couple of inches or so below the top of the glass. All right, <clears throat> thank you. You're very welcome. That's awesome. Yes. Okay. Now, um, so we have the drain valve. We have the sight glass. We have the pigtail. Okay, the pigtail is this curled pipe that gets screwed into the side of the boiler. This one's brass, they should all be brass. If you have one that's black, that means it's made of steel and it's less good. It's not as good as the, as the brass ones. They, they corrode from the inside and they clog up and they stop doing their job. So, and their job is to fill with water. And there's a, there's a slug of water in there that, that sloshes back and forth and it transmits uh, pr pressure from inside the boiler to this device, which is called your pressure troll. It's Honeywell's invention. That's their um, combination of the two words, pressure and control. And this device controls the pressure. So it, uh, you set it, there are settings on it and you set it and it's, um, it gives you a range of pressure, a high range and a low range and the boiler will operate between that range. Um, the, when the boiler is firing and making steam, it builds pressure and the pressure builds and it hits that high range and then shuts off. And then the pressure dissipates and, and uh, pressure drops. It reach that, reaches that low mark, turns the flame back on. And so that's what that does. The pressure troll modulates the pressure of the system. If this pigtail clogs, which inevitably it does, um, that, that pressure won't be sensed by the pressure troll. The pressure inside the boiler will, will be isolated from the pressure troll. And so uh, the, the, it won't do its job. And then the boiler will run and run and run and run and make much, lots and lots of pressure. And that's when water starts shooting out of, out of air vents, uh, banging, uh -huh. you get all this banging in the system and stuff. Uh -huh. And, you know, it becomes a complete uh, a nightmare. So this is a, this is a very real maintenance item that has to be taken care of from time to time. Somebody has to take this out and clean it. Um, uh, and we can talk about maintenance. Uh, I'm sure that's going to come up. 
So again, pigtail, pressure gauge, right? This pressure gauge doesn't do anything, but it's an indicator. It just tells you what, what's happening inside the boiler and the pressure troll. And this is one assembly, okay? Um, at the top of the boiler, we have a pressure relief valve. So what, that's just a spring loaded on a disc. And, and so that, that disc sits on top of uh, the pipe here, okay? And when the pressure rises too high in the system, it pushes up on that spring, opens up this valve and spills out water and steam and it's a total mess. Um, it, it's, it's, it's important to know that if you see water coming out of that or steam coming out of, out of that pressure relief valve, you have a problem that needs to be addressed right away. Um, you, you don't wanna be in the room when that relief valve activates. When, when it activates, it opens up and fills the room with steam. Um, not like a sauna, not like, oh, oh, this feels nice. I mean, like steam that like that displaces oxygen and, and, may, and you can't breathe. Um, it, it happens very quickly. And, uh, you know, steam under pressure is, is, is small. It gets squeezed. Once it, re once it uh, reaches out into the room, it gets much larger because it's, there's no pressure there. So it, it's, a, it's a really scary situation to be in if you're in that room with, with the boiler and the pressure relief valve activates. So um, it's, again, maintenance here. This is where the problem starts, here in the pigtail um, and the pressure gauge. Uh, and then the next device in this system is this low water cutoff. And there are a couple of different types of low water cutoffs. This is called a probe type. Now, a big part of maintenance used to be that you, um, you took a bunch of water out of your boiler. You did a, um, you would flush your boiler. Uh, let's see if I can find. Now, that's before this type of low water cutoff came to be. This is the, again, this is the probe type, the old type and I'll find it. Um, the old type had a lever on it and you would open it up and you would flush all this terrible water out of it. And um, what you were doing was uh, you, you were running some water over the float. There's was, there was actually a float inside there. And when the, when the float was high, that meant there's water in the boiler, it would let, let it run. When the float went low, it would open up the, the uh, power circuit to it and shut the boiler. Um, crud of all kinds would build up on that float. And so when you flushed that device, you were cleaning the float. You weren't really doing anything for the boiler, but for generations and decades, we've all gotten into this habit of flushing our boilers, um, but, but it doesn't help anymore. And I know that this is heresy because people really want to go and flush their boilers and feel like they're doing something. They feel like they've done something horrible if they've gone on vacation and didn't assign somebody to come and flush out their boiler during the two weeks you know, that, that they were away. But it's, it, it's, it's not doing any harm if you, if, uh. if, you, if you forget to do it. You're just not doing a heck of a lot. It, it, you're not doing anything for the boiler by, by taking a bucket of water out, out of, out of this, this drain valve. Um, you know, I mean, yes, you're probably getting getting some dirty water out, and there's probably some some small value to that. But to but when you replace that water, you're putting fresh water in the boiler, and fresh water contains fresh oxygen, which is corrosive. Okay, so this is not something that is sort of a passive, um, uh, you know, thing thing that that happens. You know, you, you want as much. Uh, of the same water in your boiler as you can possibly have. You don't want to keep adding water. Um, uh, and and you know, I'm going to, I'll, ha I'll have this seminar and I'll have people call me later. You know, um, it happens all the time. People send me emails the next day. So, you know, every, every day I put water in my boiler or every, or every two days during, during the season. And you're, you're killing your boiler. You have to find out where your water's going. Um, kind of off topic, but well, it's not off topic, but I'm getting into maintenance that um, I'm so ready to be done with flushing my boiler. So thank you. All right, uh, Jen. Uh, yeah, it's not something I know it's something you've assigned to yourself or your, or your father assigned to you or something, you know, decades ago. It's you're really not doing anything. Once a year, somebody has to come. You have to have somebody come and really flush it out, like really flush it out the way we do, the way your plumber does, I'm sure. Um, and, and, and this pigtail. You know, that has to come off. To get this pigtail off means taking, let's see, taking the wires off, off the, uh, here we go. 
they have to take the wires off the pressure troll, you know, unscrew all this stuff. And, 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 uh, you know, it's a process. It's, it's, re- it's, it's not a DIY thing for, for very many people. It's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a process. So have your boiler service by a professional once a year and rid yourself of the, you know, carrying buckets of hot, dirty water to the sink. Um, that's, that's my advice. Okay. Uh, more, uh, okay, any, any questions? Okay. No, we're good. Good, good. So once again, here, here is the, here's the boiler. We have steam, we have the header, we have uh, air vents, we have steam moving up, uh, up the pipe into, into the uh, heating unit, which is a radiator usually, an air vent. Uh, does everybody know uh, what their air vents do? Everybody's got air vents that hiss or maybe even spit water or something. Um, they kind of drive you crazy. Air vents come in different sizes. They have little holes in the top or on the side. And the bigger the hole, uh, the more heat you'll get to the radiator. They let air vent more quickly. As the air leaves more quickly, the steam follows. And so they, uh, they allow the radiator to get hotter more quickly and stay hot longer generally. So they help regulate the heat in the room. That's your air vent. Um, then there's another, there ought to be an, another bigger air vent on, on the pipe itself. On, uh, we call that the main vent. So at the end of the, at the, end of the run, at the end of the uh, main distribution pipe, there's a, a main vent. And that, that vents all of, this, all of the piping air, all of the air that gets trapped in the piping, not so much the radiators, but, the, but on the piping. And that's, that's equally as important because um, as you get through, let's see, as you get through, um, where are we? then we can have steam uh, uh, rise up in, into the radiator branches. So it's, it's a real balancing game. It's a real, um, there's a real process to it. Okay. So air vents are very important on the radiators. The air vents are very important on the main, on the piping in the basement. Okay. So we have a question. Is there a time of year you recommend getting service done, e.g. before start of heating season versus after the end of it? Um, no. I, I, I don't, I mean, it, it's sort of, it seems, uh, does everybody see that question? Um, mm-hmm. Okay, so everyone calls um, in September and October, you know, everyone calls at the same time. Uh, it's amazing, you know, it, uh, we, we, uh, you know we, we just get overwhelmed with people who wanna service their boilers. And some people don't wanna turn the boiler on until someone comes and turns it on for them, what, what service is it for them? And um, that's, a, that's, just, that's just fear. That's just being a fraidy cat. Um, turn the boiler on, uh, put the switch on, turn, turn the um, thermostat on and, and get heat. You know, when everybody, if you're gonna wait until September or October, you know, to, to have the system um, serviced, uh, then you may find yourself in a position where it's, you have a couple of cold days and you haven't had, uh, had you know, uh, someone come out yet. Don't, don't let that drive you crazy. Um, sometimes people do it at the end of the season. Uh, most people want it in, in the beginning of the season. I, I, don't, I don't know that there's a benefit to either. I really don't. Uh, it, you know, I, I, guess, I guess there is some benefit to having, having eyes on the boiler you know, before you turn it on for the season, I guess. You know, some, some things happen over the... Um, seven or eight months or whatever that that the boiler's down um but don't uh, don't let this drive you crazy if you if you if you didn't do it if you let it go for some reason um and, and you know and and it's winter now and it's december or january and february and you want to call somebody in to have have someone take a look at it that's perfectly that's a perfectly legitimate way to have it done also don't let it drive you crazy I think that should be the, the name of this seminar. <laughs> okay. Now, some larger systems, some larger homes, 
have two pipe heating systems. Um, same thing, except for these dotted lines. So these dotted lines represent a return. So instead of the steam and hot, uh, the steam and condensate traveling up and down through the same one pipe and a radiator, steam goes in one side and then the condensate trickles down back to the boiler through this return pipe. And there's usually a trap or something uh, on the other side, on the return side. So it, there's a lot more piping to this system. It's a, it was a much more expensive system to install. Um, it's, it's the height of technology for its day. And um, it's, it's usually in, in just the most, the biggest, you know, most grand homes that we have in town is, is where we see two pipe steam. It gets really, it gets involved. It gets really tricky, but it does allow you much greater control over each room. Um, you can regulate with these valves. You can shut these valves. You can eat, you, you, you don't have this hissing, spitting uh, air vent attached to your radiator. It eliminates that. Uh, so um, it's, it, 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 it was a great, it was a great way to make steam more livable and more adaptable to your, to your home. Um, so if you happen to have a two pipe heating system in your house, consider yourself very lucky. If you're heating with steam at all, consider yourself very lucky, or if you're heating with, with water at all, it's, it truly is, um, it truly is a luxury compared to just, you know, blowing warm air in, into your home. Um, you know, radiators, when wherever a radiator sits in a room, this the cold the cold air in a room finds the radiator, and by that I mean uh, air cold air is drawn to a radiator. The cool air skates across the floor wherever you put a radiator. It doesn't have to be under the window; it could be anywhere. Um, cool air skates across the floor and gets sucked up into the veins or the ribs or the sections of of a radiator, and and the air is warmed as it rises up through through those sections. And, you know, the, and, and then warmed air rises out the top and it creates this convective air current. Radiators do that. They create a convective air current in the room where um, all of the cool air that falls to the floor is, is sucked up, for lack of a better word, in, into the radiator and, and it's, it's made to be warm as opposed to warm air ducts that just sort of blow air in and it kind of mixes with the cool air and it, and, you know, and then when it turns off, it turns cold again. And, you know, um, you, you, you should, uh, okay. any questions? Okay. Okay. Now the, Piping, again, critical. Uh, let's see, let me see what I can share with you here. Okay, water feeders. Uh, some homes have water feeders, some don't. I know that these are a big uh, topic of conversation. People uh, have convinced themselves that, uh, that they flood your home, that their main purpose is to flood your home. Um, it's very strange. Water feeders are a very strange thing. They're, they're a convenience item and they eliminate the need for you to, you know, keep checking your water, the water level in your boiler and manually filling it yourself. They're not marketed that way. They're marketed as a, as a safety item so that if the, um, if, if, if your water level should drop to an unsafe level, um, and, and, and I'll explain unsafe, but um, it, it, it automatically puts some water in, in the boiler. So um, historically, that's how, how, how they've been marketed, where it just sort of, in case you forget, it adds water, you know? But, uh, but technology has improved with these things. And so now it's, it's, it's not just a, a, a safety item. It's actually, it actually is convenience where you can actually set how much water it, it'll, it'll fill. And you, it might go from, you know, all the way empty to three quarters of the way full, you know, to a, you know, from a bad condition to a good condition. And you might go your whole uh, heating season without ever looking at, at the water level in your boiler because this thing's sort of taking care of it. And there are 
in my industry, it's still sort of um, pre not presented that way. It's present the water feeders are presented as a, a, a backup to you looking and, and taking care of your boiler yourself. This, this uh, number is uh, this 044, that's 44 gallons. That's a, you, you can reset that counter, but it's, but it's counting how many gallons are being fed into the system. Um, you should, you should, if you've got a feeder, you should look at this every couple of weeks or every month or so and, and notice the number. Um, if, the, if there's a spike in the number, or if all of a sudden, if, if, you, if you know that every week or every two weeks, this number rises by two, by two gallons or so, and then all of a sudden you look at it and it's risen by 20 gallons, then you know you have a leak somewhere. And so this is a very good troubleshooting tool. You know, it gives, uh, and, and all, all commercial boilers, all large industrial commercial boilers have something like this. This is, this is a very user-friendly one, uh, but, the, but all, all uh, large, very expensive boilers will have some, some means of, um, of tracking water usage just for that reason, because if a pipe un under the ground leaks, if an air vent is leaking or something, you want to know. Because again, when you're losing water, you're adding new water and the new water is corrosive and that's going to kill your boiler quickly. Okay. All right. Johnny, is there only one particular brand of, of a water feeder? There are basically three. There and there's only one for some reason that, that has this feature, which is a great feature, this uh, counter feature. So I recommend this one. It's, the company is called Hydro Level. Okay. Hydro Level. And, this, and it's called the VXT, the VXT feeder. It's really, it's the only one that we sell. I just don't see the point. It's the same price. As, as the ones that don't have the feature. You know, I just don't see yeah. the point of not, not having that. So, so that's where we are with that. Um, with this comes up a lot, copper, copper pipes on a, on a boiler. Now, this system has some, has some real problems. Number one, um, this arrangement of piping where we have the two pipes that come out of the boiler and between them, this is the header, Right, this is the equalizer. Remember from that picture before. Use the header. Now the pipe that goes up to the feed, to feed the radiators and the piping in the system is between the two pipes that come up out of the boiler. You can't do that. Uh, everything tells you not to do that. Um, uh, your boiler's manual tells you not to do that, and that's because the the bit of uh, of condensate and water that gets and the water droplets that get mixed in with the steam in here, they can't find a way out. They get shot up uh, up into the system. They get sent up into the uh, into the piping and the radiators, um, and they rob the system of efficiency. They when when steam and water uh, come in contact with each other, uh, a couple of things happen. First of all, there's usually tremendous noise. That's that's what water hammer and banging when your when your steam heating system is banging, making all kinds of noise. It's it's one. There's one cause of that, and and that is steam meeting water, steam meeting standing water most most often. So a back pitched pipe or something, or or but you, but you don't want to give the system a head start to that condition where you're throwing water up up into the system. You want steam to rise up and water to, to go down. When you put that, when you put that, uh, where'd we go? When you put those, th this system pipe between the two boiler pipes, <clears throat> you push a bunch of water up, up into the system and, and, and you start all kinds of trouble. The, the other thing that happens when, when steam and water mix is that um, they, they, they fight, they fight with each other and the steam always loses. The water is a much more stable uh, element. And so the, 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 uh, the heat in the, in the steam is lost to the water and, and that, and that uh, the heat migrates to the water very quickly. And that steam, um, um, it, it collapses. So steam is very large, steam collapses and, um, and so, so two things, again, that causes a lot of noise, but it also, you know, that steam that, you're, that you paid to create is now water and it's now just rolling back down to the boiler. It's not up in your radiators. So you, it, you've, you've robbed yourself of a great deal of, of efficiency there. Um, so you don't ever want to see that. There's another problem up, up here. I won't get into it, but, the, but whenever there are two 
you know, that this one goes to the left, this one goes to the right, these should both drop down separately in, into this pipe. And um, there's just, uh, that's just the, that's the way to do it. You know, there's not a boiler sold in the world that doesn't have an instruction manual and, and a, you know, with, with very clear instructions on, on, on the pipe diameters to use, the, the configuration, the arrangement of piping, and it's all got to be that way. And, that's, and, and that, is, that is the reason why boilers are smaller now than they used to be is because it's up to the installers to, to pipe them correctly and pipe them the way the, the, uh, uh, they've been tested in the factory to, to work at their best. So here we have two, uh, a pipe coming up out of the boiler, a pipe coming up out of the boiler. All the steam is, is moving in one direction. And then these two pipes go out to, to the radiators. So you can see, we didn't put these pipes here between, between the boiler pipes. We put them on one side. And, and that's what every boiler manufacturer, every installation manual is asking you to do. These are steam leaks. That's, that's steam, that's leaks in copper. Now, um, copper is not ideal for steam. I don't wanna say you can't use it or that it's a tragedy if you have it. Um, sometimes it's absolutely fine, sometimes, but other times um, it, the copper can't handle the stresses of, of the expanding and contracting steam. And so you get these, you get these leaks, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my page here. You get these leaks that don't really look like leaks. When we, when we see, it's a gas leak. You know, when we see a leak, when we think of a plumbing leak, we look for a puddle on the floor, right? That's not what a gas, that's not what a steam leak is. A steam leak uh, just go, you know, goes out into the atmosphere. And again, you're losing steam means losing water, means adding new water and, and uh, you know, diminishing the, 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 uh, the life of your boiler because you've, you keep bringing in new water with new oxygen into it. This is what you need. You need the old stuff. You need, you need threaded cast iron and steel uh, pipe and fittings um, in most cases. If, again, doing, piping a boiler with copper, um, it'll get you heat. It'll get you heat to your radiators, no doubt. It'll get you a cheaper installation price, no doubt. It's a much faster way to do it. Um, but just, just look, if you're going to do that, or if you have that, look for stuff like this because it's trouble. Okay. Sure. Now, um, got some other stuff. Air vents on the radiators. This is wrong. Okay, you have one pipe that comes up out of the ground. This is a one pipe steam system, one pipe steam radiator. This air vent is in the wrong place. This has to be on, on the other side of, whoop, this has to be on the other side of the radiator. Okay, so what the way air vents work is that they vent air until steam reaches them. When, when, when hot steam reaches them, they expand inside and they close up and they close the little hole that's on top here and they stop being air vents at that point. They stop venting air. So you don't want this to be close to the steam source. You want this air vent to be on, on the other side away from the steam source so that it fills the radiator with steam mm -hmm. before, before air reaches it. Now, this is a thermal image of, of what's, what's happening in this radiator. And you can see steam is coming across the bottom. It rises up on the ends. The, the cool uh, cast iron actually helps draw the steam up into it, up into the radiator. So the end section is getting hot. And this end section is getting hot. But this whole middle, all these, these intermediate sections are still cold. So once again, we, a tremendous loss of efficiency here because um, you know, we're not using the whole radiator. We're using what a third of the radiator or, or something to, to heat the room. So move that air vent to the other side, the whole radiator will get, will get hot. And, and, uh, you know, that takes care of that. Um, it's gotta be right. It's gotta be right. Um, so this is, a, this is a steam radiator that has a vent at the top. Um, 
air, the air vent has to be in, in the middle down here. There's a tapping for every radiator has a tapping, has one tapping up top in case you're using it with hot water. You do, you, you would vent it from the top um, manually with, with, with a screwdriver or something. Uh, uh, but every radiator also, they assume that you may use this with steam. And so they put a little threaded tapping down in the middle here. Once again, steam coming in from the floor makes this whole thing hot. And then the steam, as it, as it moves over, the steam has turned, has closed this air vent here. It's not a very clear picture, but this is an air vent on, on the end here. And now we're left with, and this, this pattern repeats itself all, all the time. Um, we're left with this whole big section of cold radiator. So this, uh, th this chart, this graph, whatever you want to call it, down here at the bottom is, um, is showing that, that the, the, darker, the darker spots are 72 degrees. The hotter spot, spots, which are lighter, are up to, or as much as 218 degrees. This is 218, and this is all, all, the, all this in here is you know, 70, 80 degrees or so. So we're, again, we're sort of cheating ourselves of uh, the, you know, not, not getting the potential of this radiator. Mm -hmm. So hot water systems run differently, right? I, there's somebody here said they had a hot water system. Um, there's, you know, it, it really is, is it, oh, by the way, this is that uh, float type low water cutoff with the handle that you'd pull up to flush. Um, the, I, I'd be surprised if anybody here has one of these in, in their home. Um, but getting back to a hot water system, um, nothing is the same on the hot water system. Everything is, uh, let's see if I could pull this up. This is your distribution. On a, on a hot water system, you'll have a you'll have a uh, uh, a radiator. Uh, I'm sorry, um, a, a boiler that that makes hot water and sends it into uh, a manifold like this, where pumps, you know, um, zone pumps um, connected to thermostats in different parts of the house. The thermostats activate each each of these pumps as as needed, and so the water is sent to to radiators in different different parts of the house. Um, it, it's a it's a bit more foolproof. It, it's a it's it's more flexible. It's a it's a very good way to, to heat a home. Um, you can adjust your flow rates. These pumps can work at different speeds and deliver more or less water as as needed. Um, you can modulate your water temperature. You know when we when we make steam, we have to make the water two hundred and 12 degrees, and then much hotter than that, actually, it's not readable on, on, a, on a thermometer, but we have to add a lot more BTUs to change state, to go from water to, to steam. Um, so it takes a lot of energy to make steam. When you're heating with hot water, I have some systems out there where I'm heating homes with 125 degree water. It takes a lot less gas to do that. That doesn't necessarily mean that a steam system is less efficient, um, but uh, but it, but it does mean that in, instead of having uh, a radiator fill with very hot steam and then cool down and then 40 minutes later become very hot again, you know, um, instead of having that sort of these pulses of heat, um, hot water can deliver steady, uh, a steady temperature through, throughout the home at, at, a, at a lower temperature, but just longer, you know, so it, 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 it tends to have less of what we call temperature swings in the, in the living spaces. Excuse me, Johnny, Brian Gunther has raised his hand. Okay, oh. Brian? Hi, I was wondering what kind of maintenance does this kind of system need? A hot water system? <clears throat> yeah, with, with natural gas as the uh, energy well, source. Yeah, so all boilers need, um, well, here, here's this again. Um, all boilers need to be disassembled. I don't know if I have a picture of the tubes here, um, kind of. So this is your burner assembly. You have a, you have a, a gas pipe that comes in and, and an electronic gas valve. There's a pilot assembly in here and there are these tubes down at the bottom. I don't have a better picture of this, but... Um, the tubes get dirty and 
carbon monoxide rises. Carb, uh, the, uh, so carbon monoxide is um, unburned fuel after the ignition uh, process, uh, after the combustion process, I, sh I should say. So the cleaner this stuff is and the more free freely that gas and air than that can, can mix and flow and be ignited and rise up through the boiler, the more cleanly that happens and the more quickly that happens to a point, um, the, uh, you'll, you'll keep your carbon monoxide production low. You know, and um, and you and and we also, which also means raise your efficiency. So so keeping it clean, keeping these these tubes. Someone has to we 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 come and pull them out every, every year, clean the inside, clean clean the there are little holes inside, little perforations where where gas comes out. You have to make sure that those are clear. Um, so it it's really that it's not. Um, there's, there's no flushing involved because once again, you want, you want to, especially in, in this system, you want to keep, you want to keep the same water in that system for as, as long as you can. So it's, it's a, it's really a, a cleaning. Um, there are safety features here. Let me show you this one. Let's see. So uh, this is the flue that comes out the back of the, of either a hot water or steam boiler. They're both the same um, down at the bottom here. It's wide open. It's this, so um, and and this is open because if there's a uh, if there's a if if there's some crazy wind or or something that that's happening outside, some kind of you know uh, that where where air can actually be blown down the chimney, the air will blow down and out 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 of this opening rather than. Uh, have air flow through the boiler and put the pilot light out. This is something that the fire department insisted on decades ago, and we st and we still do it. Um, so it used to it, it used to be that wind would blow everybody's pilot lights out, and and different fluctuations in air pressures and in the home and outside, and it's it's, it's something that happens. So having this open piece on the bottom uh, eliminates that. However. It's, it all, it's also, it also create, creates a very vulnerable spot for if a bird makes a nest or the chimney co collapses inside or something, you know, the, the boiler doesn't know that. So it, it's still, it may still run. And so while it's making all this carbon monoxide and all these exhaust gases, and then, um, uh, it, you know, it's instead of fl flowing out through the flue and fl through the chimney, all that stuff will spill out here. It's an odd little system that we allow to happen here, right? But this piece, this is called a uh, spill switch. And, it's, and this senses the heat. A lot of people will tell you that it senses carbon monoxide, but it doesn't. There's nothing, it's, it's, it's not that nearly that sophisticated. It only, um, uh, it only senses heat. So, if, if, the, if all those flue gases should spill out of this, what we call a draft diverter, then uh, it'll open up. It'll actually, this button will pop out and the circuit that goes to that gas valve will actually open up and, and cut the power, cut the power to, to the boiler. Um, and and, and uh, somebody would have to come and press this button again to reset it and, and get it to work. So um, that's, that's one safety device that has to be has to be looked at and checked every year. It's very important. Um, you also, there are also signs that it's not working. There is some, if, if there's discoloration here, if there's rust, if, the, uh, um, if there's uh, you know, streaks of, uh, of where there was condensation or, or something, this is nice and clean. This is brand new, this, this is great. But as, as this thing starts to show signs of, of wear, um, there's always a reason for that. And, and it's usually not a, not a good reason. I mean, this, this should look like this for 20 years. And if it doesn't, you know, um, there's that. There's also another um, device here, similarly. Okay, so here, here are the burner tubes. Uh, so gas shoots through these little brass orifices. It mixes with air here. This is called a Venturi. And, it, and the air and the fuel mix together at, at a, these are, this is an engineered space. This, this, this um, so, the hole in this little orifice and, and this space here are carefully engineered to, to mix a certain amount of gas and air together to, to create a clean burning flame under the boiler. Um, they are not field adjustable. So 
uh, like they are in, like they are in oil. Anyway, so uh, so these things uh, uh, make heat in the bottom of the boiler. If the boiler should now the boiler has sections. The boiler is like a loaf of bread. You know, all the slices you know s squeezed together, and between those is space where heat is absorbed from the flame and transferred to the to the water. We call this a heat exchanger. Um, so, uh, but ha but over time, those spaces get smaller and soot develops in, in between. And so all the, car all the carbon monoxide, all those uh, the combustion gases can't get through. And if that happens, they'll spill out. They'll actually spill out the front of the boiler. This senses that. This, this is um, what we call a spill switch, um, a rollout switch. The one on the flue, they work very similarly. They both sense heat and they both open up the circuit if they, if they activate. So the one on the, on the chimney, on the flue, that's a spill switch. Uh, opens opens when it detects heat at that point after the boiler, just at the base of the flue. This one uh, reacts to temperature changes at the at the base of the boiler, the in the, the where the air uh, is being taken into the boiler to mix with gas and uh, go through the combustion process. So this is the beginning of the boiler. The other one is the end of the boiler, right? So and so so sort of both ends are protected, and the, both ends are sort of uh, that that's where. Um, that's where a problem presents itself, either either at the beginning of the boiler or, or at the end. There, there's not a lot we can see or detect inside inside the boiler. I hope I've answered your question. So there's a bunch of little little uh, safety devices that all have to be looked at and um, and make sure that those are, those are working. Thanks, Johnny. We have a few more questions. Um, sure. So Neil O'Donnell writes: If a radiator is not getting hot. Would that suggest the vent may be faulty or the wrong type size given the location of the radiator? Are there vents that you would recommend replacing with for this scenario? Yep. Um, uh, if a radiator is not getting hot yet, for on, on steam, it's usually a bad air vent, usually. Um, so you can, put, you can pull that vent off you can do it yourself. And that is very, is very much a DIY thing. Just grab it, put a towel on your hand or something, or maybe it needs a wrench, possibly. But usually, they're fine little threads on there. Usually, they're not very tight. So, so you can uh, um, unscrew them yourself, bring them to a hardware store, get the next one, get the next bigger one, or just have a few of these on hand. They're like 20 bucks, 25 bucks. Um, I really like the, the brand Gorton. Gordon, uh, G-O-R-T-O-N. Um, they're, uh, they're oddly so, uh, sized, they're oddly named. They, they go from small to, to large. Another way to say that is from slow to fast. Um, and that's the graduating size of the hole uh, that lets the air out. And they go, they're named four, five, six, C and D. And they actually, um, and this drives people crazy, but it's number four, number five, number six, number C, and number D. So um, you can um, you can have a couple of those on hand, or you probably have a vent on every radiator and just go around and swap them. You know, take one from one room, put it in the other room, swap them out. See, you know, you don't always have to buy new ones. You can sometimes just swap them out. If they don't work, obviously they throw them out. There are people who say, oh, just boil it on the stove in vinegar. I've never seen that work. So just uh, just go, you know, spend 25 bucks and, and buy a new one. Thank you. Um, um, sure. Liz Zenobi writes, I believe I have a two pipe system and several of the radiators don't heat up all the way through. Some stay entirely cold and others just heat up on the edges. Is there anything I can do? Yeah. Um, two pipe steam. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to the other guy. Um, where are the drawing? There you go. Okay. Two pipe steam is different in that Here's how these fail. The 
for steam to move, you need a difference in pressure. So uh, by that, I mean, there's, there's a steam supply side that's pressurized by the boiler. There's pressure there. The other side of the radiator or of the system is this dotted line side that, that terminates into an open vent or an op a wide open pipe or a big giant air vent or, or something. And so there's no pressure on that side. So it, um, so that's what, that, that's what draws steam in, into the radiators. Steam is trying to get away from the, from the pressure and to the, to the unpressurized side. What, ha, what happened, the way two, two pipe systems fail is that these, these traps fail. And, and if they fail to closed, if they, if they fail to the closed position, then they don't let air out. And, and the, you know, the air uh, from the uh, supply side, from the pressurized side can't get out. And so that locks that up. Now, all of a sudden the steam can't move because it can't push the air out. So that's how, the, so, that, so that happens. If they fail the other way, if they fail to the open side, um, to the open position, then steam will keep coming through steam and pressure and pressurized air and pressurized steam will push through the radiator and push through the stuck open air vent. And all of a sudden there's, there's pressure here, there's pressure here, there's pressure here, there's pressure here, and there's pressure here. And so all of a sudden this, this side, this next radiator, um, which is supposed to have, an, um, supposed to have um, th this sort of group, this uh, unpressurized side, a safe place for, uh, for air to escape and for steam to travel to, it's not there anymore because it's being pressurized by the radiator next to it or, or below it or above it or, or two doors down, whatever, where um, the, the, st the steam has now gotten into the return and pressurize the return. And so it, it, um, it eventually dissipates and it, doesn't, it usually doesn't affect the whole system, but, it, but one bad trap on one radiator can wipe out heat for you know, several rooms. Um, so that's how they fail. And, and yet, so it's, these traps have to, they have to all work. Um, that's probably your problem. If you have if, if you have a two pipe system and a, and a radiator doesn't work, you, you, if if it's one radiator, it's probably that that radiator's trap is stuck shut, probably. Um, but uh, it it takes it takes a little takes a little troubleshooting to to get to get there to, to figure that one out. Okay. All right. Yep. Any other questions? That's it for now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. So going through this once again. Uh, yeah, this is a very common type of a, a circulator pump for circulating hot water systems. This green pump, it's called not taco, but taco. Very, very common. If you have a hot water system, you should keep one of these because they all fail. Eventually, you should definitely have one on hand. Um, they're about a hundred bucks for the small ones. Okay, more, this is more steam boilers and we can see that the, you know, the, the pipes are big and they are screwed together. And, uh, you know, this is uh, just a couple of installations. Um, <clears throat> this is a, this is a, a well-functioning um, steam radiator. Uh, actually, I'm gonna say this is a hot water radiator. Uh, the, the pipe comes up from the floor, feeds the top, feeds everything evenly. And then the, and then the uh, return water goes back to the boiler from the, from the bottom of the, of the radiator. Um, it's a game changer to have one to have one of these um, to have one of these uh, thermal imaging cameras. You can actually watch the heat running through a building, through the piping. Um, he, here, here, uh, here is where the it's showing me some pooled water. This pipe is back pitched. It actually got water um, stuck in the in the piping here, so that when this steam comes around this corner and, and gets there, it creates a ton of noise, just a, a ton of noise. And that's very difficult to, to figure out 
when you're looking at something, but but using using these cameras and every every heating technician should I mean, these things are cheap now. That you know when I bought my first one ten or twelve years ago it was it was three thousand dollars. You can get them for two hundred bucks now. So uh, they, everyone should be using this. It really eliminates all the guesswork. I see we have some questions. Yeah, we have one from Andy Augusto. Um, he sent us a, a picture of a radiator and wants to know um, if it's a replaceable valve. Yeah, that's a Gorton, um, whatever it is, number, number C or something. Yeah, just screw it out and put a new put a new one in there. Um, uh, is are you having? Um, uh, is, 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 what's the issue? Uh, hi, can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Uh, hi there. Uh, it's it's in my kitchen and it doesn't heat at all. It doesn't come oh. on. And well, first first sure check, what... check check the valve underneath on uh, down down at the bottom. You've got a, um, a removable panel. Just pull that off and, and make sure that the valve is counterclockwise under there. And and but but absolutely, you can unscrew this this vent and and uh, put a new one on. Okay, great. Thank you. You're, you're very welcome. Johnny, Sarah R has a question. Um, hi, Johnny. Is it more efficient to keep your house at a similar temperature all day so that the boiler doesn't need to work so hard instead of being cooler overnight? So steam was was invented and in putting in use long before anyone had any idea that somebody was going to invent the nest. You know, so um, it it was invented. Uh, it, it was put in homes for use with coal. Coal burned, coal, the goal of heating with coal was to get 11 hours of heat. So uh, it, it, was, it was sort of widely accepted and calculated for, um, for um, you, you, would, you, would, you would put coal in, in your boiler and, and leave it alone. Every once in a while, you go put some more, some more coal in. But um, it... it it burned all day, and you know, and 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 that's and that's how you did it. Um, it the, the pipes were constantly hot. They were, and that's that's what the, all the pipe diameters and the configuration and the way that they deal with condensate and getting back to the boiler and all that. That's all based on everything being hot all the time. So um, uh, when you when you cool when you let the system cool. Um, you put yourself at a disadvantage um, because you've got to heat the boiler. You've got to heat you know, all the metal of the boiler, 400, 500 pounds, uh, all the metal of the system, another 500 pounds. And, and, then, and then once that's hot, then steam can, can actually travel through. But, but when it's cool, it, it's, it's robbing the steam of, of, of its heat. It's what's called latent heat. And so, um, so, I understand you don't want to sleep in 70, a 72, 74 degree bedroom. And it's nice to be able to, to, cool, the, um, to cool the system down. Um, so when I was taking classes for, for steam heat in the, in the 80s and 90s, they would tell us, um, it's called setback. They would call us, they would tell us that nighttime setback should never exceed four degrees. Um, I, that's not taught anymore. And I don't know what's changed. Nothing's changed, uh, but the but uh, but that should be that should be your your goal. Um, again, when when you know the, when we talk about efficiency on, on the radio and um, and we read about you know efficiency and wherever you're reading about it, it again everything is targeted to that eighty five percent of the country who's heating with with forced air, something that works very quickly and very differently than steam. So, um, so it, it's perfectly okay if you've got if you've got forced air to drop the temperature ten degrees at night, you know, because because when you turn it back on, matter of minutes you're gonna you're gonna have hot air, you know, a warm air again in, in your in your home. The system's gonna run a long time, but it's it's going to it's gonna get there. You're gonna feel it right away. So um, um, with a steam system, I I still sort of stand by that. Like they showed us in in charts again i was i was much younger and uh, they showed us in charts of of this efficiency curve of when the system's cool and it's burning heat and, and burning fuel and burning fuel but steam's not moving 
that's that's zero efficiency. That's the definition of zero efficiency. You're, you're burning fuel and, and the radiators aren't getting warm. And then all of a sudden you reach a, a temperature where steam is formed and all of a sudden you start gaining efficiency. Um, so uh, I'm using a lot of words uh, to tell you that um, steam, steam systems work best when they run at a constant temperature. Um, However, we're humans and we would like to you know, sleep in, in cooler, you know, we have our preferences. So, so if you want to drop the temperature at night, you know, consider going from 70 to 66 or something like that, but really not more than that. Really not more than that. It, it's sort of, it's, it's been, it, it, until very recently, it's, it's been sort of uh, talked about how that's the magic number. After four degrees is when you start having, uh, what do they call it, diminishing gains. Um, you know, where, where it's just, it, it, you're not, you're not, there's no benefit that you, you've, you've lost the benefit, you know, it's, you, you're, you're, you're burning more fuel to, to, to overcome that loss. Something like that. This is being recorded. This is terrible. We have to erase this whole thing. <laughs> yeah. <it's being> recorded. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyone else? Nothing right now. All right. Well, Can I ask a question? Please. Sure. Um, so you said with the circulator pumps to keep a, a spare one. Um, I have one, I have two zones that share a circulator pump, but they have a valve that's it that's controlled by the thermostat. Okay. Do those valves, do they go? Yeah. Yeah, they sure do. The zone valves. Um, the two most popular kinds are Honeywell and Taco. Uh, Honeywell is um, act, there's actually a lot more of those in the field than, than the Taco. Um, okay. the, the zone valve can be forced open. So you can get it around, you know, for a night or two or indefinitely, really. You can, like if the, if the zone valve, when the zone valve breaks, it breaks closed, it, it, it turns off. But there's a little lever at the bottom. You can manually open it and it'll just work with alongside. It'll work with the other thermostat, whatever the other thermostat is doing, the other zone is doing, it'll do that. Um, so there's, there's not a tremendous emergency to uh, having a broken zone valve. Broken pump wipes out your system. No heat. Yeah. So that's more important. I haven't had that happen yet, but I'm familiar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you will. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I think I will buy a, a backup. It's good to have to get a Tayco 007. It's a 007. Um, you'll pay about a hundred bucks for it, 120 bucks for it, or something like that, and just put it away. It doesn't go bad. Um, okay. It's good to have. All right. You want to call that done? I think so. Um, any other questions, guys? Okay, so um, just to wrap this up, this, like I said earlier, it is being recorded. And um, I plan to, in the next day or two, um, get this on a dedicated website so that it lives in an evergreen state and you guys can access it whenever you want. As you know, Johnny is also a member of Soma at Home, so you can always find him there. Feel free to DM him with any additional questions or um, you know, just tag him in a post. And I'm very happy to tell you that next month, um, we have John Cassidy from Budget Blinds joining us at the end of the month. Um, we will plan a date for that. Uh, but Sarah G is going to be interviewing John on how to uh, best dress up your windows. So with that, guys, I hope you had a great time. Um, this was so wonderful, Johnny. Thank you so much. Um, I certainly learned a lot. and have no lots problem. to tell my clients during inspections. Um, and, yeah. uh, and that was really You know, I, I, I want to, if, if I may. Yeah, um, yes, absolutely DM me also. Uh, but uh, but I, I do operate a, a company here in town called Toro Plumbing. Um, so that's, this is the, the logo if you see us around. Um, you know, I'm not here to, I'm not here to sell you anything, but if, if you wanted to get in touch with me, if you felt like you needed some work done, it's, it's better to get in touch with my office than, than to send me a message. It's just, just faster. Good to know. That's okay. good to know. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye.